So, where is my friend Julie? Ah, here you are. Hello. Hello. Great. A round of applause. Thanks. Thank you, Julie, for being with us. Uh, I don't think she needs a lot of introduction, but just a few words in case you don't know that uh, Julie is the CEO of Accenture. And uh, of course, she was leading many roles at Accenture, North American operations, and uh, of course, leading the largest uh, geographical carrier. But you are also a, a decade as a partner, a law firm, Cravat, Swain, and more. And of course, she's recognized as uh, one of the Fortune's most powerful women uh, in business and by Forbes as one of the world's 100 most powerful women. So it's really an honor to have you on the with stage. And it's becoming a tradition that we have a conversation, yeah. you and I. So thank you for your partnership, as His Excellency Yasser said this morning. Very happy to have you with us as a partner of the FI Institute. And um, let's have a, a very informal conversation, if you don't mind, because it's quite complicated to succeed to these two giants. But I'm very privileged to have you. So I have a very personal question, if you don't mind. So how uh, did an attorney career <laughs> uh, lead you to become or becoming the CEO of uh, of Accenture, which is uh, this gigantic consulting firm with what, almost half a million um, staff? Uh, 730,000. Oh my God, it's growing every so, day. So yes, yes. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for uh, having me. It's always good to chat and it's uh, been a great day so far. I, maybe just take you back for a moment to 2010. So I had been a partner at Cravath, Swain & Moore for 10 years. I'd been there for 17, straight out of law school. And I joined Accenture as the general counsel. And when I joined, I sent a note to my new executive assistant. And I said, can you make a file with this email? And I'll tell you all about my filing system. And I have 20 boxes of files that will be arriving next week. This is my first week on the job. And she replied very politely, this was 2010, that they hadn't had uh, physical manila folders for about seven years, that uh, there were only three filing drawers, but she'd be happy to help me. So this was my first inkling that I needed to change. And so I called up somebody who'd been introduced to me as from CIO, not sure I actually knew what CIO was at the time. And I said, I want you to teach me tech. I want to become more tech enabled. And initially, I said I wanted the legal department to actually lead. Because at the time, things like video weren't being used. But then if you fast forward a year later, it was very clear to me that if I was to provide the most value at Accenture, I needed to really learn tech, not just be able to use it. And I made friends with then our head of our India technology business, and I asked him to teach me tech. And for 18 months, every two weeks, we would do a call. And he would sometimes give me homework assignments. And I started to learn tech, which, by the way, is a constant, right? I'm still learning tech. Uh, and I, I share that because for many of you in this audience who's learning a lot about AI, you're probably not technologists, and I wasn't a technologist, and yet I run one of the biggest technology companies in the world. And all of us will have to continue to adapt and learn. And I'm a great example that it is absolutely possible, even exciting, by the way. And it really goes to, I think, what's very important from your career and to help your companies to be successful is to both personally be le learners and then also to enable your employees to be learners. So the last point I'll make is that I ask anybody at Accenture who has anybody reporting to them to make sure that at least once a month they are doing something during working hours where they and their team are learning. Because our skills have to constantly be improved and there's so much change. And by the way, 
if you work for someone who thinks that much about your own learning and development, that also really, really develops a lot of loyalty to that leader. So it's been definitely all about learning. And I'm at a company, we spend $1.1 billion a year um, in training and development of our people. But let's stay two more minutes on your personal journey, if I may. What were the turning points or the decisions which were really key to propel you at the top of Accenture? Well, let me take you back to when I was 15. And my father painted cars for a living. My, uh, he, graduate, he never graduated from high school. My mother graduated my freshman year in college from college. When I was 15, I was trying to make money so I could go to college. So I started working when I was 14, when you could legally get a work permit. And I would do these speech contests, uh, like for the Lions Club, where they would give you money if you won. So I was a sophomore in high school, and my dad would take me, and he was not a member of any of these clubs. They, you know, car painters didn't join them. And I was in the semifinals, and I lost. And I lost to the daughter of the president of the Lions Club. And it was a Lions Club contest. So on my way home, I tell my was father. Was it a fair contest? Well, on my way home, I was complaining to my father. Dad. And my father looks at me and he says, I believe you can do anything, but you're never going to be the daughter of the president of the Lions Club. And he said, so to win, you have to be so much better than everyone else that they can't not give it to you. And tonight, you weren't that much better. <laughs> now, I'm 56 years old, and I still remember that advice. And today, I translate that at my own company into what we call, we have eight leadership essentials that we promote, we nurture. And one says, lead with excellence, confidence, and humility. And if you were to say the one reason that I think I'm sitting here on this stage as the global CEO of Accenture is because of those three characteristics. Because when you have humility, right, when you can know when you're not that much better, when you know that you need to learn, you build great teams, you become a learner, and you never become complacent. And for the last four years at Accenture, we've been transforming, and we're transforming again as Gen AI is coming. And the only way you can transform is you have to be willing to say, I need to do something different. And so I, I go back a lot to that lesson from my father, uh, and uh, I try to remember it every day as I lead Accenture. Since this morning, we hear a lot about AI, AI, and just spoke, you just spoke a few seconds ago about AI. Um, and you advise many government leaders about many AI strategies. As an attorney, um, how do you think can government ensure that AI is safe and fair without, I would say, uh, stifling uh, private innovation? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is uh, regulation needs to be the outcome of a very strong public-private partnership because most governments in the world do not have the access or the talent inside to know it. And so, you know, and I think, for example, in the US, the executive order that was um, published a few months ago is a great example because that executive order started with a partnership with the technology companies, agreeing to make sure certain things were going to be safe, and then a lot of dialogue. And when you read the executive order, it's definitely trying to balance innovation with safety. Uh, and I think that's one of the most important things that governments need to do, particularly because the technology is changing rapidly. And I think the good news is that everyone has agreed that some regulation is needed. And at the same time, the answer isn't all government regulation. If you look at the Munich Accord that was just announced at the Munich um, Security Conference last week yeah, among the ago. technology companies, which were the technology companies agreeing to work together to be able to identify deep fakes 
in the upcoming elections. There are over, over 70, 70 democratic elections around the world. And one of the great risks, right, is the use of Gen AI to create deep fakes. That is important, as important as government regulation. It's responsible companies, companies coming together in an agile fashion to solve the risks. But talking about risks, um, how do you see uh, the primary risks uh, of the, I would say, current and obvious growing divide between the global north and the global south? We spoke a lot about that. Uh, precisely this huge digital divide happening now between North and South? Well, Richard, first I'd maybe flip the question is, think about how much AI can actually help the Global South and the countries that need help through precision farming, through telemedicine and better health care, right? The list goes on of how AI can be a bridge to helping the Global South. And I think, you know, one of the things that's been great to see is Saudi Arabia, because the Global South is not all equal, Saudi Arabia taking the lead in many places to think through, you know, how can AI help and how can they be a leader? So I think it's really important to always stay focused on what are the opportunities with AI to solve the world's problems. Yeah, but if you think about Africa, we still have a huge divide. In right. And that's why, the opportunities that AI present underscores even more the important work, for example, the UN is doing, because we do need to solve it. There, I don't have a solution today, but there are important groups that are working now, like the UN, to see how to solve it. And I think what AI has done is underscored why it's even more important. Do you think the job of attorney will still exist in 30 years from now with uh, the AI revolution? I think the job of an attorney will always exist as long as there are conflicts, disagreements, and opportunities to do new things, right? I was a corporate lawyer, not a litigator, so I think about lawyers bringing people together as opposed to solving disputes. I think the work will definitely change, and it has been changing, you know, even before Gen AI, but of course Gen AI goes to the heart of language, which is what lawyers are doing. At the same time, it's not about the work itself that makes lawyers uh, useful, let's say. It's about critical thinking. And those skills are important skills to be nurturing. Like when I think about what kids should study today, a strong liberal arts education remains essential because the more that tedious things can be done, and there's tedium in knowledge workers, right? The more that you can, you really need the skills of critical thinking. Talking about skills, um, and I know how much you are spending, investing on uh, human capital at Accenture. We had this conversation a few months ago in Riyadh. What do you think are the skills and um, the knowledge area that the young generation should have now to really be successful in this new AI dominating or dominated future? What do you think, what are the advice that you are giving to the young generation? Which, which skills they should acquire? So I, there are three things that I say to the young generation. First is you need great communication skills. Like no matter what technology exists, you have to be able to communicate well. And I say that because actually schools don't spend a lot of time on that. So great communication skills. And then, by the way, I recommend a book called Weekend Language, which is really, really good. I'm bringing 300 copies to my daughter's high school next week when I, uh, when I go speak on career day. Uh, the second is that everyone, no matter what you want to study, does need to understand technology. So many, many schools now are providing technology courses that aren't for technologists, and that's just a core part of the curriculum. It should be a core part of the curriculum in high school. That will take a while, uh, but certainly need some basic technology. And then the third piece is you still have to do what you love, right? So, you know, if you do not, if you're not interested in technology and, you know, building things in technology, then no amount of your parents saying, well, you know, you really should go study AI is going to work, right? Um, and there's going to still be great careers across the board. They're just going to be different, which is why the two first skills are so important. Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for Julie Sweet, the chair and chief executive officer of Accenture. Julie, it was a pleasure Great. as always to be with you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much.